Hi, and welcome to Mrs. PM Reads. Definitely in a new location. Uh, we're gonna be here for a few months. I'm not sure this is the right corner. The light's good. Not sure about the sound, so we'll have to see. We don't have a lot on the walls here, so there's a lot of echoing. Anyway, uh, welcome to Mrs. PM Reads. And you'll see, oh, opposite side, or here, we lost the J in moving, oops. But it is Zoo by James Patterson and Michael Ledwidge. And in our last video, the Russians lost their fight against the wolves and Oz uh, explained what he had found to Chloe and he's excited to get some experts in a room and figure out what's going on. So we will continue in book four, chapter 20, uh, 60, 67, yes. All right, <clears throat> the rest of my morning consisted of a silk wood shower and a Jerry Lewis telethon worth of phone calls. By mid-afternoon, Chloe, Eli, and I were sitting around the kitchen table with our bags packed and ready to go. I guess our ride was out front when my phone went V Z V V V V T. I guess <laughs> on the table, an unknown number popped up on the screen. I went to the window and looked down. When the NSA chief, Mike Leahy, said he was sending a car to take us to a secure location, I thought he had meant, well, a car. On the sidewalk in front of our building was a camo-colored, up-armored combat Humvee with a soldier manning a machine gun in a steel-plated Tourette for traveling with a low profile, I guess. The young kid with orange hair and freckles straight out of the Archie comics met us in the lobby downstairs. He saluted. Lieutenant Durkin, U.S. Army 3rd Infantry, he said in the military cadence, a forward tumble of barks rising in pitch. Is, is it getting this bad out there, Lieutenant, I said gesturing at the war machine we were apparently about to enter. Durkin hoisted our bags as though we were a valet, as he were a valet, and led us toward the Humvee. Manhattan below 96th Street is in the process of being evacuated, he said. We're starting with the hospitals and hospice facilities. What? Why? Rat. As we rolled north through Manhattan, we saw barricades checkpoints. The city was swarming with men and women in camo. The only vehicles that passed us going in the opposite direction were government evacuation buses and more army Humvees. Times Square was empty. I glanced at the darkened marquee as we passed the Ed Sullivan Theater where they tape Late Show with David Letterman. No stupid pet tricks tonight. When we turned west on 57th Street, we heard the whoosh of fire and looked out the window to see two soldiers in silver suits kneeling in front of an open manhole, aiming flamethrowers beneath the street. We stopped on 5th Avenue and 81st Street. A chain link fence braced with sandbags had been strung across the avenue in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Upper East Side was occupied now. We had all this, when, 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 when had all this happened? And why hadn't I heard about it? The world had flipped from normal to bizarre. In what, hours? Things had seemed fine to me that morning. 
These two blocks are HQ for the time being, Durkin said as a guard waved us through the makeshift fence. This kind of reminds me of the green zone in Baghdad. We're ground zero after 9-11, I said. We rolled past sandbag trailers and stacked crates of bottled water and came to a stop in front of a stately granite pre-war building directly across from the Met. The building's interior was all gilded ornaments and Corinthian columns, glass, brass, marble, potted ferns. Dunkirk led us into the grand lobby where the NYPD sergeant checked our IDs and, for no discernible reason, wanded us with a metal detector, including Eli, just to make sure our three-year-old boy wasn't packing heat. Who's in charge? I asked Durkin. Colonel Walters, but he's in the field. The field? Well, the city. I think some of the other scientists are here. Let me show you to your quarters first. They were nice quarters. The apartment, apartment we were led into was a multi-million dollar duplex with massive fireplaces and 12 foot coffered ceilings. The living room was cluttered with marble sculptures and African masks. There was a Chagall in the dining room on the wall. Fancy digs. How'd the army sublet Xanadu? I said to Durkin. He shrugged. Ours is not to reason why, he said. You guys settle in. The meeting's on the first floor at 1600 hours. Enjoy your vacation at the end of the world. Chapter 68. We left Eli in a makeshift daycare center that had been set up for the scientists' children on the building's fifth floor and went downstairs to help prepare for the meeting. I was surprised at how quickly Chloe and I adapted to all this doomsday scenario stuff. One day, you drop your kid off at pre-K. The next, you take him to a government evacuation center's daycare facility. What else could we do? In a large alcove off the sweeping marble lobby, we worked with camo-clad army techs to convert a dining room into a conference room, complete with an interactive whiteboard. The table was a sleek, oblong, blood-colored mahogany, its surface so glossy it reflected like light as a sharply moving mirror. The room was huge, the ceilings 15 feet high, with marble cornice moldings in the corners and dark oil paintings of robber barons set in the walls. A chandelier dangled like a bunch of crystal grapes above the table. Over the next hour, Chloe and I greeted the other scientists with whom the government had shuttled in a Hummer and helicopter. In addition to my colleague, Dr. Quinn, they had recruited most of the rest of the lab staff from Columbia, as well as more than a dozen top drawer entomologists, environmentalists, and other scientists. Ah, look who it is, I said to Chloe behind my hand, Dr. Dr. Harvey Blowhard. Chloe rolled her eyes. Dr. Harvey Sultanstaw, the Henry Wentworth Wallace Chair in Biology at Harvard, shook my hand and gave me a cold, curt hello. Being proved right before your enemies is a pretty good feeling, and I couldn't help but smirk a little. I did not like this man. Last time I'd seen him, he was on the other side of a split screen on MSNBC with Rachel Maddow moderating. That was more than a year ago. As usual, he'd made me look like a wingnut bozo with his whole aristocratic persona, this handsome devil in tweed, occasionally swiping back his elegant shock. 
of silver hair. Harvey Stalston's prominent public opposition to HAC had delayed progress for years. Now, why wasn't I surprised that the officious elitist, blankety blank, was front and center in the government team assembled to solve the problem? Soon, I was standing at the head of a conference table, ringed with the country's best and brightest. I hoped all the expertise gathered in this room would be enough and that we weren't too late. I started out by quickly going over what I had seen at that morning at Bryant Park. At first, I thought HAC had a viral origin, I said, looking around the table from face to face. Everyone nodded back at me, but after seeing the animals up close today, acting in such a bizarre way, I think it's time to take a new approach. I think this has to do with pheromones. The dogs I saw today were displaying textbook pheromonal aggressive behavior. It's my belief that some new kind of morphed pheromone has entered the environment and it's probably our doing because we seem to be one of the only mammals whose behavior isn't affected by it. We came here for this? Harvey Saltonstall took a long fastidious sip from a cup of coffee in front of him while everyone waited for his next words. The environment? Please. The theory is infantile. A pheromone is a chemical that's very specific to communication within species. I've never heard of the same pheromone affecting multiple species. Are you suggesting there's some invisible crazy gas affecting all mammals except humans? Why should it not affect us? Irritating as he was, I knew Saltonstall had an excellent point. He'd immediately stuck his finger in the biggest hole in my theory. I bit my lip and thought. And we're stopping there. <laughs> All right, you guys, new location. And I think it's been a while. So I'm just gonna show you this little song. Please click the subscribe button. And if you do, you wanna click on that little bell tab and you will get a notification every time a new video posts. All right, you guys, I hope that you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time.